This Week on Quadriga, Vive la Différence. Is the Franco-German friendship cooling? Germany and France have forged a remarkable bond. They left behind centuries of animosity to foster a close and lasting partnership. Together, they have been the engine of the European Union. But Europe's financial crisis is proving to be a challenge. German Chancellor Angela Merkel and French President François Hollande have diametrically opposed ideas on how to solve Europe's financial crisis. Is France and Germany's special relationship drifting apart? Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome. This month, Germany and France mark the 50th anniversary of the treaty that melded these two former enemies into a tandem. But can they work together in future as they have in the past? That's what we want to talk about today with three Franco-German experts. Pascal Thibault is foreign correspondent for Radio France International. He's been in Berlin since 1990, reporting for a variety of broadcasters. Ulrike Guerreau is the Berlin bureau chief of the European Council on Foreign Relations. She's also worked for the German Marshall Fund and the German Council on Foreign Relations and received the French Ordre pour le Mérite for her contribution to European integration. And Albrecht Meyer is the political editor of the Berlin-based newspaper Der Tagesspiegel. He writes mainly on EU politics, France and Great Britain. Ulrike Guerreau, do France and Germany mark this golden anniversary as it was uh, like an elderly couple with clenched teeth locked into a moribund relationship or looking forward to a new strong partnership in future? Well, I think that's a very ambivalent question because on the one hand, obviously, it's an old couple, but it's an old couple that is basically in struggle again. And in, in you know, normally perhaps some old couples come to peace. But I think the franco john couple at this precise moment in history is again challenging, really um, a big, uh, facing big challenges and, um, and is uh, in a way just struggling for a lot to do on security policy, on, on, on the euro, how to, how to work out the integration of the eurozone. So um, it's not really a calm old couple. I think that's what I'm going to say. Pascal Thibault, how do you see it? What's a French view? Is the French-German couple, as the French in fact like to put it, still, uh, still a functioning partnership or in fact a moribund relationship? I mean, the partnership is functioning. There are a lot of contacts, a lot of, of uh, common meetings between uh, French and German politicians uh, since years, so it's functioning. But I think there, there is, it's not a romantic relationship. I'm not sure it uh, has been a romantic relationship in the past, too. I think we have to, uh, uh, we have to abandon, I think, this uh, legend, probably, uh, as we saw the, the pictures of uh, Helmut Kohl and François Mitterrand, for example. And I, as, you, as you already to have told, I think the big issues we have to uh, struggle with nowadays in uh, Europe uh, show uh, show us quite well how uh, big the differences are between France and uh, and Germany and I think uh, in the last uh, 10 maybe 15 years uh, there haven't been any big initiatives uh, about European topics coming from France and Germany. How bad are the strains that have developed in light of the financial crisis, Albrecht Meyer? Well, there's a fundamental difference uh, between Germany and France when it comes to solving uh, the crisis. Uh, um, Chancellor Merkel, she is actually calling for um, austerity on the European uh, uh, sphere. And as well, she wants uh, structural reforms to uh, be pushed through in, in the European partner countries, whereas France is pleading in favor of more of a burden sharing within the eurozone. This could entail, for instance, euro bonds, which Merkel does not want by any means at all. And uh, so um, France is representing more, I would say, the southern countries, which are ailing, such as Spain and Greece, of course, whereas Germany is representing more the northern uh, countries. And f for the time being, uh, Germany has been dominating, really, uh, the scene. Do the tensions over policy that Albrecht Meyer has just uh, described, do they reflect 
basic differences in philosophy. That is, of course, often said to be the case, that these are fundamentally opposed philosophical visions. Or do they reflect differences in the balance of power, Ulrike Gerl? I think both. And first, I'd like to agree with Pascal, which is that, um, I mean, we tend to see that uh, the tandem was sort of a rosy, shiny, romantic affair for 40, 50 years. It wasn't. And it was never. Let's remind that anything from Eurocore making, from the Euro making in 92, was deep, deep, deep struggle about power balances and about uh, socio-economic sort of ideologies. And France and Germany were never sort of similar. It was the strength of the tandem that you could basically merge countries which are basically totally different in the way they run their state and the way they run the economy, and still they could go for compromise. The moment you had that level playing field, you could advance Europe. So it was more coming from very different poles that make the strengths of the Franco-German tandem, rather than saying that France and Germany are really similar. They aren't. I mean, we have a republic with a president on the one side, we have a strong parliamentarian tradition on the German side, we have socio-economic cleavages which go from, you know, low inflation policy in Germany to uh, uh, devaluation sort of inflation policy in France. So this is pretty socio-cultural and it depends also on the way the countries are structured because we have a much more uh, diversification in Germany. We have a very rural area in, in France. So uh, all these differences come together and I think the, the best strength of the tandem is to basically still make a compromise possible. But it sounds like you are suggesting then, yes, one second, I'll let uh, our other guests pick up on that, but it sounds like you're suggesting that the countries are no longer able to make something positive out of their differences? Well, I think it's always when they crashed most that after then the best compromise came. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, you know, I mean, we are struggling with the same questions than 92. We are basically in an unsolved sort of uh, circle of unsolved questions since 92, which is we made a currency union without economic underpinning, uh, without major political underpinning, without legitimacy underpinning. Uh, we have been lucky that these questions for more or less 20 years could basically uh, lay beyond the surface. But now the crisis brought them up. We have to, 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 tack, to tackle them. And I think that's what we are doing. And that's why we are cl a little bit clashing now. But I think the clash, in a way, is hopefully productive. So I think you both wanted to comment. Yes, uh, just uh, one word about this famous uh, Franco-German engine, as it's always called in the media. I think we would, should abandon actually calling it uh, an engine uh, because uh, there is no longer a, a level playing field between uh, the two. Since unification, German unification, that is, uh, Germany is dominating even politically. It's been dominating economically before. And... Um, um, in the last couple of years, as uh, the advisor of the French Prime Minister uh, Jean-Marc Ayrault uh, has said, Jacques-Pierre Goujon, who knows Germany very well, he's been saying actually that in France there has been a, a discourse of dissent over the last couple of years. In Germany there has been a discourse of ascendancy. And so this is going really uh, um, apart at, at the moment. And there's two solutions to it. Either you go to rivalry, and which is the case at the moment very much, or you say, well, both countries are really complementing each other, which would be the ideal thing. But this is not happening at the moment. And, and I think the rivalry which is existing is the problem, really. So Pascal Thibault, Albrecht Meyer is suggesting that the strains that have emerged in the past few years definitely reflecting a change in the balance of power between the two countries. Would you agree? Yeah, that was my point too. Because if you want to uh, to find uh, a common solution uh, between a couple or between two countries, between two governments, you have uh, you need a, a certain balance. And there is no right balance between uh, France and Germany nowadays. There was a break already after the end of the Cold War, 1989, because uh, uh, the, the, the role, for example, of, of French nuclear bomb was uh, of course not the same and uh, and there is an economic uh, an economic uh, an economical problem because of the big differences that you, we have nowadays uh, between the two economies and uh, we saw it also in uh, quite a lot of articles in the f uh, not only but also in the German press which are very very critical against the new French government and I think it's a risk for the for the um, for the future if you want to to find common solution if you want to move uh, and uh, in Europe, you have to, uh, you, you need the two partners which build more or less a certain balance. And I think it's important for Germany to have, uh, yeah, to have a neighbor, a partner, which is, uh, yeah, which is uh, strong enough. Ulrike Gero, Germany, of course, has emerged from the crisis 
even stronger, or at least it was still looking uh, that way at the end of 2012, beginning of 2013. Uh, whereas France, of course, the economy looking increasingly weak, sometimes regarded as one of the next sick men of Europe. But there are a lot of voices in France that have actually called for a German model. Um, we've certainly in the past heard people uh, praising the virtues of the way that the Germans have handled their economy. So is there some sense in France that it needs to move more in that German direction? I think the situation in France is actually perfectly split. I think you have a very strong left who is considering that, um, and basically Hollande is, has been uh, elected with this left vote, um, and he needs to accommodate to also uh, left voices in France that uh, the Germans get it wrong, that it's basically very too painful, that you need to go for domestic demand, that you need sort of other structural policies, and that is the sort of go against Germany trend in France. On the other hand, you have a lot of French people basically in CAC 40 milieu, so the stock market milieu, but also industries and so on and so forth, who see the effort of the German structural reforms and who would love to bring France to that situation where France is also basically tackling uh, structural reforms which this country delayed for a decade at least. And they are looking to Germany and they are pressuring Hollande to do the same thing. So I think this country is in a way perfectly split, with, which does not make the situation easier. Because the problem is not only what Pascal uh, and Mr. Mayer said, um, that the symmetry between between the power balance between France and Germany is broken. The real problem for Europe is that France has a much bigger deadlocking capacity in the European process than any other of the countries. Uh, you know, I mean, Germany, uh, whether that was a good policy or not, but could basically bring Greece to Nice and, and, and you know, make the government change, bring Italy to Nice, make the government change in Italy. But Germany needs to accommodate French requests on European policy much differently than any other requests. And that is where basically Basically, um, the power now of France comes to play. In other words, you're saying that France is not as dedicated to European integration as Germany? No, I'm saying that France holds the key for much of the reforms in European integration because Germany cannot do them alone. And it needs to accommodate the French, even if the French are not wanting what the Germans want the French to do. That's what I'm saying. I'd like to take a look back and ask all of you what you believe allowed the two countries to bridge their differences successfully in the past. We can, we can say, okay, we won't talk about the tandem or the motor, but nonetheless, it is the case that for a long time, these two countries and their cooperation helped to drive European integration forward. What were the elements of that that worked well, Pascal Thibault? I think, first of all, in the first years after 1945, they were, uh, they were able, thanks to some important uh, people like Jean Monnet or Schumann in France, but also Adenauer in Germany, they were, uh, they were able to, um, to, to overcome the, the difficulties in the past, uh, the, the big uh, wars we had, and uh, to build the, uh, the basis of uh, the, the European integration. I think it's also a legend to say the Frank German reconciliation began 1963 with Adenauer and the Gaulle. It's uh, it's not right, and that was an important uh, an important fact to um, to develop afterwards the European integration and also the Franco-German reconciliation. And as uh, Ulrike Gero already have said has said, the the two different models in Europe between France and Germany, especially what the economics uh, for the economics. I think it is important because if these two countries, uh, which are s more or less the symbols of two different uh, models in Europe, are able to find a common solution. It is able to uh, obtain a common solution also for all uh, European countries. And I think it was the problem also with the so-called Mercosy, because if there is no difference if France, in this case, abandon more or less uh, its positions to uh, uh, to uh, only say yes more or less to what uh, uh, Angela Merkel said I think it was uh, it was a disaster for Europe and also for other countries especially smaller countries uh, which of course had the impression there was a franco-german or there was a German diktat more or less uh, with the 
the approval of Mr. Sarkozy. Yeah, it's the but French role to counter Germany. I agree. Let us take a brief look back at the role of leadership before we pick up on that point. It is often said to be that the personal convictions and values of the leaders who helped reconcile the two countries were one of the main qualities that drove the melding of these two former enemies. Franco-German relations were at ground zero after World War II. But French President Charles de Gaulle and German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer were convinced Europe's fate depended on peace between the two nations. They signed the Élysée Treaty in 1963, which became a cornerstone of French-German cooperation. In subsequent years, German and French leaders enjoyed a flourishing partnership. In 1989, the Berlin Wall fell and German reunification threatened to shift the balance of power in Europe. But French President Francois Mitterrand overcame widespread skepticism and endorsed German reunification. This special friendship has so far overcome all obstacles and Europe has seen decades of peace. Abolish Maya, what do you think? Are we missing leaders of the stature of those, those early leaders, de Gaulle, Adenauer, Mitterrand? Is that the problem today? Well, it certainly makes a difference uh, if you have lived the Second World War, uh, which uh, leaders uh, like uh, Mitterrand or Kohl had done, or whether you didn't, uh, as uh, Sarkozy, Hollande, or, or Merkel is the case in, in their case. Um, I think the relationship worked uh, pretty well um, due to several kind of uh, points. The Elysee Treaty came uh, about because there were different interests there and they matched each other quite well. Adenauer wanted the integration into uh, the West and uh, de Gaulle was looking for a partner basically to forge an alliance against the United States which, as we all know, didn't work because then in the Bundestag afterwards a preamble was uh, thought out saying that Germany would like to go along with Britain as well in the United States. But anyways, th those were the two interests of de Gaulle and Adenauer. Then later on, uh, Kohl was a politician who uh, was still in the re generation of those for whom it was a big event if they could break uh, the barriers at the borders. Uh, they, they saw those borders come down and he was a very Francophile uh, person as well. So there was a, a personal um, involvement um, into the matter. Uh, Giscard d'Estaing uh, and, and Helmut Schmidt, they found each other on an economic basis as being experts in, in some kind of a, a, a way as well. And uh, Chirac and, and Schröder as well, they found a common issue in the uh, Iraq war, which they uh, didn't want to get involved uh, as well. So those were all elements uh, for a, a good Franco-German alliance. And this personal involvement is not really there with, with Hollande and, and Merkel. And uh, I think partly this is uh, part of the problem as well. Ulrike Guerreau, there were, of course, different historical experiences prior to World War II, which helped to shape the attitudes that we were speaking about a few minutes ago, namely the economic philosophies, Germans' great worry about inflation on the one hand or the French statist approach on the other. But it seems like for those early leaders, de Gaulle, Adenauer, the experience of World War II was the preeminent driving experience. Do you think that's right or is that also a romantic, uh, nostalgic uh, view that perhaps doesn't take account of all the differences? I think it's both. It's right and it's nostalgic. I mean, we did the Elysee Treaty, but let's face it, the Elysee Treaty, the day it was signed was the preamble in the Bundestag. Uh, de Gaulle said the sentence that it's uh, basically uh, um, dying like uh, roses die, just because Germany did a preamble in which it stated that it wants to do NATO and not only Franco-German security uh, policy. And the Elysee Treaty, which is now celebrated 50 years, which basically led to Franco-German uh, youth cooperation, which is all nice, but it was meant to be a profound Franco-German security treaty, which didn't come to play in that, in that way. So the Franco-German relationship, in a way, is always a relationship of um, ambivalence and of ambiguity, of, of, uh, of uh, happy malentendus, you know, mi misunderstanding. <laughs> 
misunderstandings. <laughs> and and basically, I think it were it it was all misunderstandings on purpose. I think France and Germany for long didn't wanted to spell out the details, and by not spelling out the details, they could make the relationship work. On the euro and the economic side, as much as on the security side, you know, the same with security policy in the 92 when we did the euro core and when Fra France basically wanted to have a really European security policy uh, disentangled from NATO, you know, really European strengths, where the Germans wanted basically having NATO into place. So we, we kept these ambivalences out and by keeping them out, we could make the Franco-German engine work. The problem is that we need to spell them out more and more because the euro crisis, at least for the economic side, of the picture doesn't leaves us a chance to not spelling out the stuff and this is the historical moment of today we need to spell out do we integrate more fiscal integration eurobonds yes or no legitimacy political union can it work different parliamentary structures different parliamentary cultures can this be merged can there be a symbiosis this is the question of today that we are running out of the uh, buffer zone of ambiguities of ambivalences. Are we also running out of concrete projects and bilateral initiatives of the type that we had in the past? Ulrike Gero is suggesting that we had a sort of a fuzzy uh, roof over the cooperation, but that much of the cooperation took place in concrete initiatives on the ground, as I understand it. Are we missing those today, Pascal Thibault? Yes or no? Um, I think a big problem is that with the crisis we are dealing with in Europe, uh, we have now it's it's becoming better. But uh, in the last month, we have we had more or less uh, uh, crisis meetings every day, and uh, the politicians try to solve little details, uh, uh, little problems, and uh, hadn't probably no time for big projects. On the other hand, I think this crisis also uh, brings uh, some um, opportunities. And as uh, Ulrike Gero already said, uh, we have to solve uh, big questions which uh, haven't been solved at the beginning of the 90s. It means we want more integration in the, on the political hand and the, also for the uh, for, for to, to build a economical union between the different uh, countries and I think uh, it is the the, 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 the the next big step and I think it would be a, a good uh, opportunity now with this anniversary not only to look uh, to look to the past uh, and uh, to make a nice commemoration here in Berlin, but also, for example, to uh, uh, to um, to publish a, 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 a strong text or uh, to bring a new initiative for uh, for a new European Union, for example. It would be something very important, I think. I want to pick I up. <laughs> I want to pick up on that in just a moment. But Ulrike Gero mentioned just a moment ago that actually the thing that drove this idea in the beginning was security, the idea of a common security initiative. And in fact, that is a theme that has come back again and again in the Franco-German relationship. Albrecht Meyer, but a theme that sort of died out uh, recently. Whatever happened to the idea of the common security pillar? Is it simply a victim of budget cuts and financial uh, austerity? Um, I think um, the, um, the German side does not want um, too much uh, a pooling of the resources and this is actually what everyone is talking about in Europe because budgets is, uh, are being cut and if you want to maintain uh, a military force the logical thing actually uh, to do would to uh, pool resources. Now the, the Bundeswehr has been uh, slimmed uh, down and uh, um, one could argue that because of the slimming down of the Bundeswehr, you don't need so much of an armament industry in Germany anymore. But still, the official line of the German Ministry of Defense is that you still have to cover all the breadth of uh, the industry. Germany has to be capable to deliver all types of armaments for all types of uh, uh, military uh, uh, fields. And um, as long as uh, this ideo ideology has not stopped, there will, won't be a pooling of resources between um, 
Germany and, and France, which goes beyond the projects we already know with uh, EADS, the, 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 yeah. um, the big project uh, in, in armaments in, in Europe. I just wanted to add, EADS was a really, really bad shock to Franco-German relations. And I think we missed both. Both countries missed the strategic dimension of the European Union. Rem and, remind yeah, us of the background uh, of that uh, for our just, viewers just who are in, in, in November last year, basically, uh, there was a merger planned uh, uh, between or uh, sort of a different take take off EADS and then the Germans dropped out because there was struggle about the shares and the French in German eyes wanted too much of the shares in the board. Anyway, there were a lot of industrial policy uh, reasons why this basically uh, failed. Uh, but the thing is that it's it was a very important armament industry cooperation project which would have tied together the two countries also on a much more strategic dimension. And the moment you cannot work this out on the industry level because you are having uh, cleavages here, then you're also missing the strategic dimension of Europe. So I think this EADS, uh, the, the missed merger, was really a strong shock to, to, to Franco-German cooperation, unfortunately. And what, what in the end was the thing that brought it down, would you say? Well, I mean, uh, there are half a million reasons uh, uh, and, and blame gaming why it brought down. The, the Germans blame the French because the French wanted too much of the shares, more than 9%, which were accorded. But the uh, French blame the Germans that it was b because of the Bavarian elections and because ERDS would have been produced much more airplanes in France than in Germany and would have uh, led to losses of uh, uh, workforce in, in, in Munich. So, I mean, it, it, it was a blame game. But uh, what's behind is apparently political will was missing to just make it work. And and, um, and I think we will only see in, in, in the years to come how much this is a very strategic vacuum to which we are driving. You add to this uh, the, the whole talk about Brexit and the UK leaving. You add to this the uh, Franco-British cooperation on defense. So you add to this the Libya case where Germany showed dramatically its lack uh, of taking over international responsibility. I mean, we are talking often only Euro crisis and Franco-German uh, uh, problems here. But if you look at the security fields, there's a lot of uh, problems out there. Our report uh, implied that 1989 was a critical turning point. And in fact, certainly the French initially were very skeptical about German unification, Pascal Thibault, and what that would mean for broader European integration. Do you think that was the beginning of the time when the Franco-German relationship went off track, or did they successfully bring it back after 1989? Uh, I have to say there was probably a certain skepticism uh, uh, amongst uh, the French government and amongst certain politicians uh, like Mitterrand too, but I think uh, the French people were uh, absolutely enthusiastic when they when they saw the, the pictures of the wall uh, falling down 1989. So I think there's a there's a there's a difference uh, between these two levels. Uh, but uh, uh, of course it was also it was a big step because it means the the strategic balance between. Um, to say it quite simple, the, the economic German giant and the French, uh, the French security uh, with uh, our uh, nuclear uh, bomb. Uh, this was, of course, um, not so. Uh, this was, of course, not so not so valid for the future, and uh, I, it explained also uh, some new steps we had in the la in the years uh, after, like uh, the Maastricht Treaty and the um, and the common uh, currency with the with the euro uh, and uh, but i think we now needs to um, we now we now need uh, yeah more or less same import the same important steps we had in these years when the these uh, the strategic balance we had in the last uh, decades uh, were um, uh, when it's so when it's so valid as it was we've been talking a lot about top-down cooperation, but I'm wondering whether one reason that the Franco-German relationship has changed is that bottom-up cooperation has become so successful that people simply take it for granted. Do you really imagine that among young French and Germans there could ever again be enmity, Albrecht Meyer? Um, well, this is just uh, one of the th uh, strong points uh, of the Franco-German uh, relationship. Ulrike Gero has to m mentioned the, the Franco-German youth organization. And these days, there seems to be as lot uh, uh, interest in this youth organization as has been in, in the 60s. It's been waning a little bit in the meantime, but now it's, it's coming uh, back. Um, 
On the other hand, it's got to be said um, that um, pe the people uh, do not learn uh, pupils in school uh, the le language of the other country uh, anymore. So uh, the uh, Franco-German partnership cannot be really uh, taken for granted uh, as well. And uh, I, uh, one thing I found rather startling was uh, a poll which was done last year in, in France by um, a polling institute called EFOB, and they said uh, that only 31% uh, of the French thought that Germany was the most important partner, and only 18% of Germans thought that France was the most important partner. And th those figures have been going do down since 2003, really. So. Um, one should not be too self-assured uh, about uh, the solid base of uh, this uh, Franco-German partnership, which certainly is there and on many polit uh, on many personal and political uh, levels. But um, the the it's it's sometimes fragile as well. But on the other hand, Ulrike Gero, contacts across the border are so intensive and so every day so normal that in fact if you were to start a war today for example in the Alsace region of France you would probably wind up uh, targeting a whole lot of Germans who were over there doing their shopping. No we don't do war huh? it's not the question of war but what we are talking about I think is a question of alienation and it comes through cultural alienation I pick up the point that language uh, learning across uh, is, is, is decreasing um, much less French people learn uh, German and vice versa so it might be good that we all talk English, but you lose cultural skills, right? Um, uh, the Germans are going global economically, but this means for Germany, most Russia, China, global markets are not really France. Uh, there's a huge talk in French, in, in German business community, that basically France is not getting its act together, and so it's not sort of the market of the future. But what is more important, I think, is that uh, with all the talk about the euro crisis and the social crisis we are in, that the social uh, split of today may be the European split of tomorrow. When we are talking about all these cross-border contacts, it's the question for whom. It's the Erasmus use, it's those who study abroad, it's uh, the EasyJet use, you know, who pick a flight for 60 euros to go to Paris, but this is not, this is only half of the youth. And there is interesting empirical data out there that you have a deep split in mobility among young generations, those who are more or less left behind in both countries, right, um, and the social poor, and that these people are going to have a, a cross-border contacts tomorrow, where should it come from? So I think the use, the new generation is as split on European integration as on Franco-German relation and contacts um, um, as we haven't seen before. And this might be a problem of alienation tomorrow. I, I think we, we always uh, speak, especially in our circles, yeah. about the problems, especially in the, about the problem between the two governments, between uh, the governments about uh, uh, European issues, for example. But I think there are some problems also uh, because uh, there, there are less German uh, learning uh, French and uh, also in, in France uh, uh, French, French learning uh, German and German learning French. But I think there are much more uh, relationships between the two societies, between France and Germany, than there are between France and Great Britain, between France and Italy or, or Spain. So, uh, and there are quite, quite a lot of relationships between association groups, uh, uh, trade unions, uh, cities, uh, universities. So uh, it's important also to uh, to underline. I I think these facts. But I think new initiative, probably new models, new uh, personalities, maybe who who could be uh, um, interesting for young people uh, should play a, a key role. Like uh, we saw that in France some years ago with the German group, uh, German band uh, Tokyo Hotel. Uh, leading uh, young uh, French people, especially uh, young women, to uh, learn <laughs> German, for example. <laughs> and I think probably it uh, was more important for the f German language in France than all the, all the millions yeah. uh, the two governments, or the, the French government, spent uh, in uh, wonder, wonderful advertisements. Albrecht Meyer, where are we going? in the future with this relationship. Can the European crisis be solved without the full horsepower of the Franco-German motor? No, it, of course it, it cannot be. Uh, although I've been saying we should probably stop talking about uh, this engine, uh, the Franco-German couple is really uh, essential to solving this crisis. 
Um, but since we are in a more of a rivalry mode between Merkel and Hollande at the moment, I can't see the crisis to be solved very soon. Uh, Merkel wants to win uh, her election uh, this uh, September, and during this year I cannot see that uh, she will enter into any talk about euro bonds or uh, into a second haircut uh, for Greece, for instance. All these issues will be uh, pushed aside. And unless there's going to be another urgency uh, in the euro crisis, as we've been seeing last summer uh, when uh, the head of the ECB, Mario Draghi, had to intervene. But for the time being, uh, uh, the situation is rather calm. So Merkel is not, that would be my bet, is probably not going to move too much into the French uh, direction and uh, going uh, too much uh, uh, as uh, into the directions of the demands of Hollande uh, uh, this year. But in the long run, uh, they have to get their act together. But still problematic, because beyond 2014, we're talking about possible changes of the, the European treaty, um, which might entail, for instance, further budget control exerted by the European Union. Um, the French side does not want this too much because it's got some suspicion that uh, Germany is pushing this point just in order to get more dominance uh, in Europe. So this is why Hollande uh, does not want to enter too much in, into that uh, discussion. So I'm not too sure whether we are really going to see any, any treaty change uh, in, in, in that sense. But um, the only solution only can be uh, complementary because uh, we are going to see a recession this year in, in Spain. We are going to see a recession, the sixth year of recession in, in Greece as well. And so that there has been some stimulus uh, as well for these countries. And France and Hollande is the advocate of this kind of stimulus policy. And somewhere or another, Merkel uh, has to give in. So that probably is the solution. Ulrike Gero, what needs to happen? to bring French-German leadership back in a constructive fashion? Well, um, that's a Nobel Prize winning question. And uh, you just <laughs> won the Nobel Prize, by the way. But, uh, well, I mean, cynically speaking, perhaps the crisis needs to go further down to really increase both the social pressure um, um, and the market pressure to make the system move again. Uh, because I agree that we had three years of a crisis. The, the system, the European system, uh, integrated more fiscal, political union, banking union and all these things. But now pressure has moved away, so there's less pressure on markets and basically France and Germany are withdrawing from really going into action. Uh. That's related to the German elections, I agree. So the real question is if after the German elections, we will take the or size the momentum of 2014 to make a bold step. Uh, 2014, we will see European elections forthcoming. We will probably have a convention on some sort of treaty change because all the stuff which is on the table now, banking union especially, uh, the question of debt mutualization, will ultimately need some sort of treaty change, be it chirurgical uh, uh, treaty change or big bold treaty change. That's a different question, but something, right? And France and Germany will need to lead that momentum. And we will have a new commission by 2014. So the real question is, you know, 2014 is a big date. 1914, we know what happened, right? So it's 100 years after that Germans, that Europe has a second chance. And I think we should live that momentum and France and Germany hopefully will live it. At this moment, January 2013, of course, there is another treaty that we've been talking about in this uh, program, namely the Elysee Treaty, does turn 50 this month. There had been talk, Pascal Thibault, about somehow rewriting the treaty to reinvigorate it. That talk has more or less died out, but is there something that could be done to revise the treaty and thereby reinvigorate this partnership, or is that a purely formalistic idea? I think uh, if it's... Uh if a new treaty or if a new version or whatever, of, or if some new paragraphs only consist on in some wonderful, nice ideas without uh, without in without uh, content. I think it's it would it wouldn't be interesting. And I think it's important. Of course, it's a French French German treaty. But I think what is nowadays important more than France and Germany 
and uh, Europe is not only France and Germany. <laughs> and I think it's new initiative, new proposal for Europe, especially also with other countries. Uh, of course, it's our topic today, France and Germany, but uh, where are the proposals coming from other European countries? I'm, I, I, can't, I can't see them. Uh, of course, the southern uh, countries, they, are, they have so many problems um, with their economies. They don't probably have uh, uh, time to think about it. Uh, I can't see any proposals coming, for example, from Poland, which would be, uh, I think, a, a very interesting contributor also to the French-German uh, alliance. Albrecht Meyer, 2014 has been suggested by Ulrike Gero as a perhaps critical moment. We do have elections coming up this year in Germany in September. Do we have the leadership that we need in the two countries to bring the solutions forward? Um, well, um, I think it depends. Uh, uh, the question is open uh, who will win the German uh, elections first of all so we don't know uh, in what shape uh, Germany is going to enter the year 2014. Um, I think both Hollande and Merkel are very much devoted uh, to the European crisis. They spend uh, a lot of their political energy to, uh, to solving uh, it really. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm quite confident uh, as far as uh, the, the, the political power is, is concerned. But um, they uh, still um, haven't come over their mutual suspicions. They haven't overcome them, really. And so um, this is the basic uh, uh, struggling point b between uh, the two of them. Hollande, for instance, still hasn't forgiven Merkel that she uh, uh, supported uh, Nicolas Sarkozy during the election campaign, for instance. So uh, and. Um, uh, Merkel, on the other hand, doesn't listen too much to uh, Hollande. She would probably rather uh, listen to Mario Monti, uh, on, on the other hand. So if they might overcome uh, their, their mutual uh, suspicions, probably then uh, they would have, the two of them would have the potential to overcome the crisis. But this is precisely the point. We, are no lo we should no longer reason in this sort of national, you know, I mean, it's about European policy and it's about European democracy. This is what is at stake in, in, in the years to come. And we fix this or we won't. Uh, but uh, this sort of, I, I'm basically, I, I was happy that Merkel uh, uh, um, um, was uh, on the side of um, uh, Sarkozy in the campaign because Europe should be political about political camps. So, mm. I mean, you cannot basically blame her that she supported her party partisan in the other country and that's basically the the policy shift that the European system should should uh, undergo so um, as long as we reason in, in in you know national approaches Monty Hollande and Merkel I think we are doomed to fail and I think this is at stake what we missed last century and perhaps this century we fix it thank you very much those are optimistic if pragmatic last words we'll leave it there thanks to all of you for being with us and thanks to you out there for tuning in